Uh, welcome everyone to the Board of County Commissioners policy session on February 15, 2023. Gary, would you please call to order and take the roll? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Smith. Uh, all commissioners are present. Commissioner Schrader is on her way. Your first policy session today is annual work program for the Clackamas County Vector Control District. Joshua Jacobson is the executive director of the County, Clackamas County Vector Control District, and he has several of his board members here. Maybe you'd like to introduce your board members, and please go ahead, Josh. Sure. Um, yes, I'm Joshua Jacobson, executive director. Uh, with me today, I have uh, two of my board members, Dan Green, our chairman, and uh, Lowell Hanna, our treasurer. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, so, yes, we're here today to discuss with you our annual work um, plan and our um, annual report from the previous mosquito season. So um, I just wanted to kind of cover the highlights of the, the work that we did this past mosquito season here in Clackamas County and, um, and then uh, look for your approval of our annual work plan for this um, 2023. So um, we have Five, five members on our board, I said two of them are here today, but um, as you can see on the presentation, the, the others are listed there as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our introduction continued here. Uh, just our vision statement, our mission statement, um, you know, we want to control public health vectors in Clackamas County, provide a, a safe environment free of uh, mosquitoes and flies that can, um, be an annoyance and also spread disease in our county. So uh, our authority to do so is established through ORS 452. As you can see there, um, this also allows us to um, go out for our funding for the district as well. So, so some of the highlights from our 2022 mosquito season, uh, you can see our actual budget expenditures for the um, season was uh, $1,136,342. Uh, this allots us uh, four full-time positions and then up to 10 seasonal um, staff that uh, help us accomplish our, our work during the summer. Um, we have 13 vehicles, two are equipped for spraying um, for mosquitoes. We responded to 643 requests for assistance from citizens this year and we completed 779 mosquito treatments. Um, that's both for mosquito larvae in the water and then um, adult spraying as well. Uh, we collected 15, a little over 15,000 mosquito samples this year. And uh, that was larva samples. And then uh, 4,942 adult mosquito samples this year as well in our, in our traps. And then uh, pending the species that are in those traps, we, we test those for West Nile virus. And uh, we did not detect any West Nile virus this year, so uh, that was definitely good. Uh, we also distribute uh, the gambusia fish, which eat mosquito larvae. Uh, we place those in aquaria habitat, that uh, maybe a horse trough or ornamental ponds, things like that. Um, and we place 792 of those um, throughout the county this year. So go next slide, please. Um, one of our, our biggest concerns in Clackamas County is West Nile virus can affect um, people and um, our equine population as well. So um, West Nile virus is a um, disease that is spread by mosquito, the bite of the infected mosquito. It's a, carried by birds and it's a cycle between the mosquito and birds. So we have um, birds kind of transporting the, the virus around as a, as a reservoir essentially and then mosquitoes pass that on to either us or the or horses. So um, as you can see in the map we had uh, West Nile virus uh, in the southern and eastern part of the state this year. There was three human cases um, over on the east side of the state in um, Baker County and Malheur County but um, we didn't have any West Nile virus activity in in the valley this year. So. That's great. great. That's wonderful. Yeah. It's too bad for the counties who did have it. Yes. But I'm glad uh, we didn't have it up here. I am as well. <laughs> um, our second, um, one of our other large concerns, I'd say, is uh, invasive species. Um, so as we're experiencing um, climate change, uh, mosquito species are, are moving um, and also are being transported around um, by human means, whether it's in 
um, cargo trucks or things like that, we can have mosquito species that are imported from other areas. And so we're continually monitoring for that. Um, we have specialized traps set up at um, around large distribution areas. So we're trying to monitor for, for those species. We're concerned with them because they have the potential to um, spread more um, diseases than the mosquitoes that we currently have here. And they tend to be a little more aggressive mosquitoes as well. So um, next slide, please. Um, as you can see, this is um, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are the two mosquitoes that are invasive that have, they started down in Southern California. They've been slowly moving their way up the state of California. Um, we think it's just a matter of time before we probably detect them um, in Oregon. So those are the ones we're, we're watching out for. Mm. Uh, while we had uh, your attention today, we just wanted to promote some, some basic mosquito um, knowledge and what, what homeowners can do in Clackamas County to help us out. Um, and that's just look for standing water around your property. Uh, could be clogged gutters even in the summertime, a boat holding water, horse troughs, um, bird baths, anything like that uh, can breed mosquitoes. So um, we ask that you know, homeowners do their best to help us have Clackamas County have a reduced mosquito population. So, um, and then if the homeowner needs help in some fashion um, that they can't do themselves, they can always call us and, and that's what we're there to come out, give them an evaluation, see what we can do to help them control the mosquitoes on their property. And then um, kind of what we're looking forward to in this next year, um, at starting tomorrow, we will be moving to our new facility over at 320 Warner Mill, the old Oregon City Police Station. Um, that move should be completed the following week. Um, so we'll be looking at operating out of that facility for the 2023 season. And um, I just wanted to also mention our, our public outreach program that um, we've worked hard over a lot of years and it's become quite successful. We do a lot of, of work at schools, um, libraries, and um, have different programs, even a, an educational app that um, can be downloaded and played as well. So. That's all the information I have, have for you, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you for this report. I know commissioners will want to ask questions. So on your new facility, the former Oregon City Police Station, did you have to do much remodeling? We're, we're looking to do that. We, we haven't done it yet. We're moving in um, temporarily. Um, we'll be occupying the building. Um, we're in the process of developing our um, RFP for the remodel of the facility, but yes. Okay. And did you buy the building? Yes, we did. How much? Um, I think it was just under three million, two two point eight million. I think. I think we we didn't approve that, but we heard about it. I think is that correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Schull. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joshua. That was very informative. I appreciate it. On the slide that showed the areas that currently have the West Nile and Zika virus mosquitoes, uh, do you know if the state is focusing effort on those areas to push back that problem to keep it get to keep it from getting closer to Clackamas County? Um, yes, there. All of those um, areas that had West Nile virus have mosquito control districts as well, um, and they are actively doing the very similar work to what to what we do each year to reduce mosquito populations. Um, they have protocols in place as well for when West Nile virus is detected in a trap, they, they treat those areas um, specifically to um, knock down those populations to reduce the likelihood that those mosquitoes will spread the virus further. Um, so yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Commissioner Savas. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I saw the in your packet the budget, the one page with the budget issues, and I, I think the virus that's affecting governments at large is inflation, <laughs> a different kind of a bug. And just kind of curious is the fiscal health, um, trying to deal with cost outpacing revenues. You guys doing okay? Yes, we're very financially sound. Um, we have all the funds that we need to do the work that we need to get done. So. Okay, great. Yes. Congratulations on the purchase of the building. I know that's been something you guys have been sweating for a long time, so that's a, that's a big win, so. Yes, thank you yep. very much. 
appreciate all the good work you do, and uh, I really do appreciate hearing from you uh, annually about what you're all up to and how you're coping with, uh, with your work. So great stuff. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Commissioner West. Uh, are the services um, that you provide to Clackamas County residents, are they free of charge, or are you guys reimbursed for the services if you come out, let's say, to my house and if I have a mosquito issue? No, all, all of our services are, are free of charge. We're, um, so the taxes that we collect fully fund the program, and whatever services we offer are available free of charge to um, anybody who lives in Clackamas County. Uh, the little fish, is it called gam Gambusia. Gambusia? Yeah. Uh, it's not native to here, correct? Correct. So is that, do you guys only use a certain gender of fish to help it, to, and they have to resupply them, or are they fine in our habitat and not invasive? So th they are, they're not native, they're invasive, and the um, permission that we have to use them th from ODFW is that they can only be placed in aquaria habitat. So we're very selective. Okay. Um, it used to be that people could come get the fish and then place them themselves. Um, so now the agreement is that we, our trained technicians are placing those in the habitat so we can verify there's no inlets, no outlets, um, no possibility of overflow into natural bodies of water. So it, it really constrains it to ornamental ponds in people's yards, uh, bird baths, or uh, maybe horse troughs, something like that. So like a koi pond would be appropriate to put this in during the season? Yeah, yep. Okay, and then um, are koi ponds, like I guess it's ornamental, so that's a big vector of yeah. the mosquitoes. Okay, yeah, well, thank you, good work, and um, glad you guys are out there uh, battling the biters, so we appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, I just have a <clears throat> biology question here. So both species of mosquito Aedes can spread Zika, Denengue, and Chikungunya? Mm -hmm. That's okay, correct. so they're vectors. It doesn't matter what species it is, it's just the genus. Um, uh, I mean, I'm just wondering what's the major vector of what? What species? Sure, yeah. so just those are the um, two that are um, an invasive species of mosquito, right. so that we don't, we don't have um, currently, but uh, they just those two tend to be very competent vectors. Um, and then their other characteristic that makes them um, undesirable is they're aggressive. The 80 species in general is aggressive. So they're a daytime biter. They, they're the mosquitoes that won't leave you alone. They chase you down. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Great. So do you work on any other uh, species besides mosquitoes? We do flies as well. Flies. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask this question, and uh, because a lot of people talk about it, and that is the stink bug population that has invaded, especially South Clackamas County, is horrendous. And it's quite an invasive species, and it's starting to f affect crops. It can burrow down into the branches of the hazelnut trees and actually within the nut can poison the nut. Okay. Do you have any information on that? I, I don't offhand. Um, if you'd like more information, I could surely get it for you and, and provide that, yeah. Do you know if there are any efforts, either at Oregon State Extension or Oregon State University, to try to contain the stink, bud, stink bugs and or eradicate them? Not that I'm aware of at this time. Um, they, they tend to be difficult to control. They're very a hardy insect, so they're um, not easy to kill either. So. Um, I think we look at a lot of, um, you know, any type of treatment for them. We would have um, a lot of um, casualties of, of um, maybe beneficial insects as well. So um, it's, I'm, I just, I don't know the answer at this yeah. time that anybody's currently do working Do you ever on. get contacted from constituency about stink bugs? We do. Um, we keep a list each year of, of the phone calls that we get of, you know, various pests and such, and, and we do get stink bug calls. I don't think it's typically a, a lot, um, maybe 10, 15 calls a year, something like that. So. Okay. Um, any other questions from commissioners? I will accept a motion to accept the 2023 annual work plan for vector control. So move. Second. Commissioner Schrader has moved to accept the 2023 annual work 
plan for the vector control, and Commissioner Savas has second the motion. Any further discussion? This has been great, Josh. Thank you for your work. Of course. Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Commissioner West? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. If you happen to have any information on stink bugs, yeah, go ahead and send it over to me. Okay. I will Thanks do Thanks so. a lot. Thank you very much for your Good time. Good work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Gary? Thank you. The next policy session is intergovernmental agreement between Water Environment Services and the City of Milwaukee for the Kellogg Good Neighbor Program. Greg Geist is the Director of Water Environment Services. Aaron Blue is the Finance Manager for Water Environment Services. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Chair Smith and Commissioners. Uh, by the way, this weekend I found two stink bugs in my basement, and I've never had them in my house before. They're so. becoming more hardy. Excuse me? They're becoming more hardy. Apparently. I didn't yes, know that. and we never, just on a side note, we have time. They never used to be year round. They have survived this winter like you can't believe. Usually they'd hibernate or go away or just die off, but it's almost on a yearly cycle now. Yeah. So go ahead. I think uh, there's an order of the Actually, what? There's the order of Hemiptera. We get hundreds of them on the back of our house oh. sunbathing. It's obnoxious and oh, gross. Oh, it's terrible. And they stink. They do. They, they live up bugs. to their names. Yeah. Yes. So, Greg, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, so today we have, I, I call it the tale of, of three IGAs, uh, two of which are in place, one of which is what we're considering today. Um, generally, the, these good neighbor IGAs are for cities that host uh, wastewater treatment plants that serve other cities or other regions, because obviously our treatment plants do have an impact on the community and we want to be a good neighbor. Uh, we take, take dollars out of the uh, tax base for these cities. Um, so we think it's a good practice and program to have good neighbor agreements. Um, the first one that we had, um, well, I'll just say, so we've, we've got three that we're talking about today. The first one was put in place in 2012 with the city of Milwaukee, and it was kind of a subsection or a subpart of a broad uh, service agreement for between Wes and Milwaukee that goes all the way out to 2037. Uh, so we've been operating under that since 2012, and I'll talk more about that. In 2019, we entered into a good neighbor agreement with um, Oregon City and Gladstone. So Essentially, our, our plant is in Oregon City, but it's just across the river from Gladstone. So we entered into a, a different IGA with those cities, which I'll explain as well. Um, and then we were approached, we were essentially shared that information with Milwaukee and were ultimately approached with a request to update the, the good neighbor portion of that broader IGA. Uh, and that's the third IGA that, that we're talking about today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, basically, yeah, uh, our, the goal is to be responsive to the cities, to show our commitment to being a good neighbor and to align uh, with our mission. Um, like I said, the Oregon City Gladstone was a, a, what we call a clean sheet agreement, whereas this one is essentially taking portions of the 2012 agreement with Milwaukee and updating it and into a separate IGA just for the good neighbor portion. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as the project's uh, eligibility, we're looking at recreational improvements, pathways, bikes, trails, uh, water quality, habitat, education, and just opportunities for collaboration. Uh, pretty, I wouldn't say broad, but uh, a fairly broad range of activities that benefit the community and align with our mission. Uh, next slide, please. So currently, this is a... Uh, kind of an overview of uh, aerial of the Kellogg facilities. And these are some of the accomplishments that we've had to date. Um, we've collected a total of one point, almost $1.4 million into a fund. And so the way that that works, uh, the way it was set up back in 2012, is Wes sets aside $1 per household per month uh, yeah. and sets it, sets it aside into the Good Neighbor Fund. That's about $11,000 a month, $132,000 a year. Uh, Wes acts as the bank and essentially holds those funds until the city requests that they be paid out for the projects related to the Good Neighbor uh, Agreement. Um, and anyway, so those are some of the projects. A lot of stuff uh, 
landscape, uh, pathway, lighting, improvements directly around uh, the facility as well as debt service on Milwaukee Bay Park, which is a little more than half of uh, that monthly amount that goes out. Um, next slide. So one of the uh, desires, I would say, of Milwaukee was to expand the boundary. So the, in the 2012 IGA, it sets a limit of 200 yards from the fence line where those funds can be expended, and that's the image there on the left. Uh, which, <clears throat> yeah, fairly constrained around the facility. Um, the image on the right is what we worked with with Gladstone and Oregon City. And you can see our, our plant is in the upper right portion of that, and the boundary of that good neighbor uh, area that, where funds can be expended is quite a bit larger. Uh, and that ref really reflects the needs of and the priorities of Gladstone and Oregon City. We are in the Oregon City Urban Renewal District, and they're very interested in connectivity and parks and pathways and things like that in that area. And same thing with Mil or Gladstone on the other side of the river. Next slide. <coughs> So in speaking with Milwaukee, they also had a desire to expand um, the boundary where they could expend funds. And whereas Oregon City Gladstone is pretty focused on the mobility aesthetic aspects, um, Milwaukee wanted to have at least the opportunity to do more riparian restoration and habitat work. And so that, this is the map that they proposed uh, within their city limits where, where those funds uh, could be expended which is obviously much larger than 200 yards around the facility. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you an overview of the Tri-City uh, uh, IGA, that one, uh, while it, it's a different, <laughs> it's approximately the same amount of money per capita, uh, but what we do is we set aside $250,000 a year. That's distributed directly. We don't hold that money, uh, and we don't distribute that money piecemeal um, as projects. We, we say you can have this money on an annual basis. It's split based on population uh, between Oregon City and Gladstone. So that 250 goes out the door. 200,000 right now approximately goes to Oregon City, 50,000 to Gladstone. Um, and then they have very similar or the same requirements for um, how that money can be spent, where that money can be spent. And then they, they do an annual report back to us and say, here's how we spent our money. Um, and I'll, I won't go through the list, but those are some of the projects that uh, Oregon City and Gladstone are already are either working on or uh, intend to complete with those funds. Next slide. So back to the, the issue at hand. Uh, on the left-hand side is kind of a summary of the current 2012 IGA. On the right-hand side is the new model. And again, I won't go through in detail, but I would just say that the big differences um, are that the city manages their own funds. We're not acting as the banker and the bill payer um, uh, and, and their own project list, um, and obviously the expanded boundary. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. I know some folks have questions, so I'm happy to answer any questions? Next so slide. this is an interesting good neighbor agreement where there's, <coughs> like you say, funds set aside and the cities then take that money and they put it toward projects that they think are important to them, like trails or park cleanup or, or a whole host of things. But it's their decision based upon community input. Yes. Sounds really good. Commissioner um, Savas, you're up. Yeah, just a little bit of history and then I'll, I'll jump to today, today's world a little bit here, but uh, this was a um, originally something that we negotiated with. Um, I had the privilege of representing Clackamas County to solve a 25-year dispute between the city of Milwaukee and Clackamas County related to the Kellogg treatment plant. So the, and a lot of it was brought out because of, you know, not all of it, but a lot of it was brought out because of the impacts of the plant to the local community as well as the park asset and so forth. So, you know, we were successful. We signed the agreement in, in December 2012, I believe. Yeah, 2012. And um, the principle, again, was, you know, the, to, to address the impacts. While that was happening, the other cities, elected officials and constituents um, in the Oregon City, Tri-Cities area, Gladstone, 
also had had concerns and had been involved in my district life in the past, I certainly knew what some of those issues were. Tri-Cities was the county service district for Oregon City, Gladstone, and West Lynn. Uh, again, the plant is not near, really near West Lynn as it is like it is in Gladstone or Oregon City, but the Gladstone citizens have a bird's eye view of this facility. Uh, very few Oregon City residents have a bird's eye view of the Tri-Cities facility. Um, as the plant was redone and rebuilt, a lot of millions of dollars was put in there. Part of that agreement was that there would be substantial screening, um, a, a number of things, but one of them was substantial screening along the along the um, the the neighborhood facing the plant, which is a handful of neighbors actually, um, and the businesses nearby, as well as a screening from the Gladstone side. There was a lot of issues around that. Now, certainly, elected officials come and go. The privilege of those elected officials to be elected officials and have the opportunity to speak, whether it's a mayor or a city council, you know, there's turnover in elected positions. So, but the issue is not lost. Well, it is lost now. This issue is lost. And that was my point of trying to bring that up. I was hoping that Greg and I, you know, could get together well in advance of this session to solve one of those. And one of them I mentioned was Milwaukee. I have communicated with City of Milwaukee and the mayor, and um, you know, we, you know, they are okay with this, which is great. Um, and you know, my, my concern was was that one of the conditions of approval, as I understood, for the the expansion of the Tri-Cities facility uh, was the screening along the eastern facing, the freeway facing, um, the the exit uh, was a row of trees and screening and so forth, um, uh, and also along the walkway facing, again, facing the Gladstone side from the park, from the community, from the neighbors nearby. Um, that's lost. That's all been lost. and. I, the principle of the Good Neighbor Program was to, you know, fulfill past obligations. I'm one that, you know, if we said we do something, I feel compelled, even if that elected official is no longer in their position, that still the promise should still be fulfilled. And I'm afraid it just got, it just fell through the cracks here. So I just have that one concern. I just hope that there's um, a concerted effort, frankly, Greg, to, um, to, um, look into that understood um, <clears throat> I can speak to both of those I think uh, the <clears throat> screening that was required when we built the MBR back in 2011 that would be along 205 that was required by the city of Oregon City um, and it was put in and it's failed um, if, if you look there now there's uh, between the drought we had in the last few years and then when they did construction of the bank building across the street they did quite a bit of damage over there too. So I'm certainly happy to approach the city and say, hey, this appears to have failed. Can we, should we replant it? What would you like? And then on the other side, um, when we did the expansion for the uh, solids handling project, part of Oregon City's requirement for that project was that we do plantings, screenings on the bank of the Clackamas, which we've done. They're, they're new, um, but we're taking care of them and uh, it'll, it'll get better. No, well, that was a, a, that was more than two hundred thousand dollars worth of planting that we did. Yeah. Well, there was a, there's a story behind the, the failure, and that we were we and and the local community and others said, hey, that's a huge investment. It's a public investment. Why you allow, why are you allowing those trees to die? Why aren't you taking all these steps to protect? So there was an effort, but it was seen to be just dismissed. Yeah, I, I was only recently made aware of even that requirement. It, predated me and I, yeah, I didn't even, I didn't know that we were responsible for trees on the other side of Agnes. Um, I do now. Okay. Other, Paul, are you done? Do you, no, want, do you want some more, you want I'm, I'm talk a little, some more? I'm a little frustrated, but I'm, I'm finished. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Commissioner Scholl? Uh, thank you, Greg and Aaron. Uh, looks to me like the people of Milwaukee we're getting quite a bit for a dollar a month. I mean, what you're doing yeah. seems to me that this should be received by the people of Milwaukee with uh, great appreciation. I, I hope so. It, it's with good intent yeah, okay. and in a collaborative and in a partnership yeah, approach. We're working really well. You can't get much these days for a dollar. You know. 
So you're doing a good job. <laughs> Thank you. You know, that's a really good point. <laughs> Even the dollar stores in the dollar. <laughs> yeah. It's a dollar twenty-five now. <laughs> Thanks, inflation. <laughs> Any other comments from commissioners? No, I just appreciate all the hard work West does for us, and um, I don't know. I would suspect. You know, we're facing climate differences now, so it may just be that we need to look at a different kind of screen, mm -hmm. but um, I appreciate the fact the effort did happen. Yeah. It, it, just as an aside, since we may have a little bit of time, I'm t I, I came to understand that, the Oregon, that Oregon City required us to, the assemblage that was pl to be planted or that was planted on the other side of Agnes, between Agnes and 205, was to represent the species along the Oregon Trail, Trail. in Oregon. Yeah. So whether that's, you know, yeah. in the drought resistant, so yes, we need to revisit. We don't that. know. We don't know what the reason was. It was a fairly elaborate requirement. It at wasn't the time. about the best species to survive that environment to do the job that it's intended to do. It was more about like an art project. Not that, to my knowledge, yes. Just wanted to clarify that. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, it just seems a little ironic that the uh, the reason that the trees died, or at least a lo lot of the people that looked at it, including an arborist, that said, you know, they need water. And right across the street, it, we're processing millions, <coughs> millions of gallons of water. It just seems ironic that we couldn't fight a little bit of water across the street In to water the trees to make them survive. That's the shame. That's probably more to do with tri cities and but I'm hoping we I'm hoping we we can remedy that actually. I, I think we can still in good faith, Frank, go back and fix that. I do too. And I think it's an obligation of the district. It's not an obligation of this of this dollar this dollar per month. Yeah. Was right. it a forest for two hundred thousand dollars? Like oh, no. the, how many trees are we talking about? It, I don't know exactly, but it was a line of uh, a line of trees. They weren't like rare trees or it just wasn't it's just No, it was just native species trees and along the planting and we're done. I'm sorry, I missed that. Why couldn't we call like a group like Friends with Trees and yeah. have them do a planting and it's solved? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll reach out to Oregon City and say, Howdy, what do you, what do you sure. want to do here? This is this failed. Um, let's do something that's sustainable. That'd be an easy, cheap solution to yeah. solve it. And frankly, make sure that it gets on our radar for maintenance because yeah. it wasn't before. We don't know what you don't know. Yeah. I mean, people well, make assumptions and they never talk about it. You know, assumption, like you say, came before your time 10, 15 years ago. And how would you know? Yeah. Okay, good. Any other comments um, for Greg Geist? I will accept a motion as recommended for option one. Chair, I move to approve the IGA as proposed and agreed upon by the city of Milwaukee. Second. Commissioner West has moved for the approval of the IGA as proposed and agreed upon by the city of Milwaukee and Commissioner Schrader has second that motion. Any further discussion? Yes, Chair, I'm going to vote yes on this, but I, I do want to say that I want to do, I do want to circle back at some point and get a report on what we're doing for the remainder aspects we discussed here today regarding the Tri-Cities plan. But this is an agreement from I understand. Kellogg, oh, right? I, I understand. Okay, do we, all right. Okay, any other comments on this? Yeah, and I will just say then, Greg, we'll be talking about that probably in our meeting, probably one of our management meetings with all of the cities involved. So yep. I'll make sure I get that back to the board. Okay. Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Apologies. Director Schrader. Aye. <laughs> Director <laughs> Scholl. Aye. Director West. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming forward today with this important work. Gary, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. We're ahead of schedule. Staff is on their way. We need like five minutes. Yeah, we're going to recess for five minutes. Clean Thank you water. very much. Uh, we are back from recess. <clears throat> Gary Schmidt, what's up? Final policy session today is 2023 Regional Transportation Plan Project List Development Continued. We have staff from Transportation and Development, the Long Range Transportation Planning Program, Karen Burig, the manager, and Dan Johnson, the director of the department. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Whoa, there's a TV here. Nice. Um, <laughs> Chair Smith, commissioners, uh, we are here to have a continued discussion around the RTP. Last time we were here, we talked to you. There were some questions. Um, we've done some follow-up, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen to kind of um, highlight some uh, recommended adjustments uh, we were put forward for your consideration. So with that, Karen. 
Yeah, excellent. Um, it's great to see you all this morning. Karen Burig, Long Range Planning. Um, so again, the last time we spoke, um, we shared information mostly about process for the 2023 RTP update and the call for projects. Uh, included in those materials had been the project list Clackamas County had submitted in the 2018 round, the previous round. So um, today, and as a part of your materials, are the, is the project list um, for Clackamas County nominated projects for the 2023 RTP. And so I'm really gonna focus on um, the differences between the um, 2018 list and the 2023 list. Um, and I will use these terms. So the, 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 the terms that are important for this list is it's broken into three categories. One is near term, and near term are the years from 2024 to 2030. And then there's a far term, um, which is the uh, 2031 to 2045. And those two are within fiscally constrained. So there's two buckets of physically con fiscally constrained, near term and far term. And then there is a strategic list. Um, so when we submit this information to Metro, they're in these three different categories, and we generally have to show, you know, the, the I would call it fiscal constraint, that we have the revenues coming in, uh, or we would anticipate to have the revenues to cover the different projects. Um, so since we met last time, staff provided the opportunity to meet with um, the board members to get their input on the different projects. And from those meetings, uh, the primary requests um, related to the project list had to do with removing the three TriMet projects that um, Clackamas County had sponsored previously. We had previously in the 2018 had nominated three different projects. One was an HCT, a high capacity transit project along McLaughlin. One was indicating um, transit service along um, I-205. And another was frequent transit service along 172nd. So for those projects, removing them the reason, kind of the, just a little bit of, of um, background into why um, it uh, would be they moved down in priority is first of all, there's been a kind of a broader, um, a broader look at high capacity transit and regionally high capacity transit along McLaughlin Boulevard is not a high priority. So we're moving that off. Um, and then the transit service, both on I-205 and 172nd, the transit service is, is included within TriMet's list. So just so we're all clear, each jurisdiction moves forward projects on a list, on their list. And, um, and so we are just many, one, many, one of many jurisdictions, and TriMet itself puts forward a list of projects for the RTP, and they include all of their anticipated future service, future operations. They have kind of a bucket for that, and they have assumptions about that. Um, and so those two, it would have been duplicative, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so also an, another um, item that uh, we added due to the conversations with board members is we added a project called Transportation Demand Management and Transit Supportive Uses. Um, we move, we uh, added that to the fisc fiscally constrained list. And what that really means is being able to look at, um, make investments in transportation demand management techniques and transit supported investments such as microtransit, shuttles, mobility hubs, first and last mile items, shelters, park and rides. All those things that will help people use the transit services that TriMet provides. Um, and things like microtransit, shuttles, all of those type of things are really important transit supportive investments. So being able to put a bucket, not saying, not saying specifically where it would be spent, but saying, hey, we, we know into the future over the next 20 years, that's something that's gonna be really important and we could potentially get federal funds. You know, there might be federal funds that could flow to something like that. So the other type of, of um, just minor adjustments, I would call to the list, had to do with uh, moving projects in between categories. So um, there were three projects that were moved up um, from the far term into the near term. Um, that was the uh, 65th and Ellingson Stafford project, 82nd Drive and Strawberry intersection improvements, and design for the I-205 multi-use path. All three of those we've known are very high priority, very important 
projects. Um, and we would definitely like to be able to see if we could get federal funding for those projects. So we put them within the near term. Um, secondly, we moved one project from the strategic list onto, or one project was moved from the strategic list onto fiscally constrained. That had to do with bikeways on Flavel. That, uh, again, is an area that ha is, is experiencing additional growth, um, and seeing investment in that area at this time would be appropriate. Um, lastly, there were three projects that moved from the fiscally constrained onto the strategic. So that, that basically says, hey, we know these are needed, but we're not quite sure if they fall within our constrained funding amount. Um, so that would be uh, pedestrian bike, bicycle improvements along Johnson Creek Boulevard. Um, the third phase of Johnson, uh, sorry, third phase of Beaver Creek Road improvements. So that's the phase that's south of the Oregon City High School to the UGB, mm -hmm. way down at the end. And then finally, there was a project that we had worked on previously, which was called the Lake Oswego to Oak Grove Bridge. Coming out of that project really was this idea that we needed to look more broadly um, at uh, crossings of the Willamette River. And so that we moved into the strategic list, previously had been fiscally constrained. We tweaked the name of the project as well. So that's a really high level, the type of changes um, that are between the 2018 list and then this particular list that's in front of you today. Okay. Now, did you explain these changes the last time you were here? So the last time we were here, we explained that the, um, there was going, we were starting from the 2018 list mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that we were here, we, we were interested in hearing input from the board. Mm -hmm. And so from that time that we heard the input, we met with different, um, we, met with the, we offered to meet with the board members. So, so we didn't go into detail of all of these different changes because we didn't have them then. Yeah, great. Yeah. I have a couple of commissioners with comments. Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah, well, I appreciate your work. I appreciate the recommendation, but I do want to talk through the three projects that were removed a little bit, just briefly. So uh, what I am aware of is that the uh, parking structure, parking capacity along the McLaughlin corridor is one of the access issues, and that's, that's in the works, as I understand it, yes. right? Mm -hmm. TriMet's acting on that. Um, that's in the works. Um, we are cognizant that the that TriMet uh, took down the Clackamas County high capacity transit projects or the ranking and brought them way down to a point where they're not gonna be funded or eligible for much, obviously, uh, compared to what they have focused on. So that's, that's embedded in, in what they've recommended for the high capacity transit element of the RTP. So my colleagues know that. The, um, so, the 172nd one, you mentioned TriMet's including that, so it's there. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though we're not interested in it. So let's talk about the 205 and the wording along that. So uh, I was just looking at the wording. It says along the 205 corridor, and I know that, you know, we were looking, ideally, looking for something deeper than along, but embedded or a system, you know, present in the 205 corridor. The, the wording makes it look like we wanted to have it along versus within. It, I mean, maybe it's semantics, um, but I know in our, in this trade, it's, it's more than semantics often, right? Yeah, and so my, um, my response would be is the, the RTP list focuses, like individual fo uh, projects focus on capital, but then different jurisdictions also have operations money, right? So we were talking about that a little bit. And so, Currently for that corridor, both operations of a, a transit line with, a, along I-205 would be covered by TriMet. Um, but SMART, who also is a jurisdiction and a partner, um, is planning on operating a connection through that area and also with um, ride connection you know, through that bucket of shuttle money. And so that, it, it's kind of covering the operations side is being covered by the TriMet operations as well as smart operations and any sort of um, uh, regional coordination bucket money. So not necessarily on our list, but on other people's lists. Right, so I, at this point, Chair, I'd just like to just mm -hmm. address my colleagues um, at the dais, and that mm -hmm. is that um, over recent years here uh, at our, whether it's our Clackamas County Coordinating Committee, C4, or whether it's the subcommittee, 
We've talked about transit often and the desire and needs for that, and especially along the 205 corridor mm -hmm. and some of these others as well. And what we've realized, and staff has said this, we realize is there's, I won't say an overabundance, but there is a lack of funding for operations and maintenance to expand transit in this region. That's been living that, unfortunately, for the 20, my 20 something years of public, public uh, life. Uh, but there seems to be a lot more availability of, of uh, money for capital and projects. And we have talked about the fact that our terrain, the grades, if you live at the top of Westland or the top of Oakfield Ridge or down in Willamette, Fault, Willamette Drive in Westland, you know, it's steep. Mm -hmm. You know, access is an issue. So, you know, logically, I think we, we would say, well, geez, it'd be really great if we had a circulator or a, a system. Well, that's more operations and maintenance. There is a little bit of capital that's associated with that, with bus shelters and so forth. But the biggest aspect that came out of one of our discussions was, geez, if you had a park and rides, right, and you have an abundance of capital money, and then park, a, par, a parking structure, park and rides would be a capital investment. Um, there's no labor associated with that. That would be a means of getting people to, they could drive from their top of the hill, bottom of the hill, and drive to a place, and then if the transit line is there, they can connect there. Sure. So you get access, so you get access to transit, which is the issue on McLaughlin, it's, the, it's a greater complicated issue on 172nd. Um, and so my, what I don't want confused here is that um, the needs for those corridors, the three, it's not about removing them, it's about refining the needs in essence. But at least maybe, I'm not arguing with, it sounds like it's covered, but the 205 one, I wonder if we, if adding that back or putting greater definition on that is, is, is am I upsetting the apple cart by doing that? But I don't want emphasis of the 205 corridor lost. Um, I, I, I understand your concern. Um, and I do believe that the um, importance of the I-205 corridor, and even as it, um, uh, well, the importance of the 205 corridor, and even with the application of tolling, there are items within the TriMet list that would cover for additional service right along I-205. Now, I believe also this new project that we have integrated, which talks about these transit supportive su services, that includes park and rides, that might include shelters, that might include additional shuttles or micro transit, um, also emphasizes that, that we know we need to make those type of investments to support things. And those are the type of investments that would be needed along the I-205 corridor. So I, I feel as if that it would be covered within that project. Okay, so getting back just quickly, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at this, um, getting back to whether it's semantics or it's terms, you know, nomenclature, Mm -hmm. um, would it be smarter for us to say park and rides that include parking structures? You know, knowing that land's, land is short, right? Um, but park and rides sometimes require, usually, they're, you know, unless they want to buy a property um, and, and make it a park and ride, but usually it's, a, it's a, a, a borrowing of space, right, or a lease of space often. And I do think that the um, RTP projects in some ways are um, vague enough to include a variety of, of solutions that are needed at the time that the funding is requested. Does that make sense? And so, um, so I think the term park and ride would include in that umbrella um, a parking structure, uh, if so needed. Um, so it's, it's kind of this interesting little balance you want to have a, um, a pin <laughs> that says this is important, but you don't want to over-describe. Yeah. And, you know, it's like if you live in the Willamette area, um, either side of, either side of t the 10th Street exit, you know, how would you access transit or, have, or park your car to access transit if there was a, a along the corridor? That, I'll leave it there. I'm done. I just want to just use that as an example. There's a lot of population there coming down Solomon Road, Obviously, coming up from the bottom of near the river up from Willamette, um, that community, how would, where would they park uh, to get access to transit? Oh, okay. Thank you. Commissioner Shaw? Yeah, thank you. Most of these uh, <clears throat> projects appear to have a safety-related uh, focus. Mm -hmm. 
Um, does the RTP list provide enough projects to uh, expand vehicular lanes to relieve congestion? Or, or do you have a intent to make this list mostly safety related? So I would say that we, this, this list came from our transportation system plan. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, the high priority projects, the tier one projects. Um, and within our transportation system plan, those projects that address capacity are often intersection projects. Mm -hmm. We actually, on our system, on our county road system, we have very few at a lane on mm -hmm. our county system. Now that's different on the ODOT system. Um, so ODOT's project list may have some more of those. Mm -hmm. um, but I will highlight to you one example of a project that is on this list that's, that's um, in your materials that we would be nominating are the intersection projects along Highway um, 212 that we discussed mm -hmm. uh, as a part of the Damascus Mobility Plan. And those are improvements to Foster and um, uh, Sunnyside Wow. Um, Highway 212 and the other important intersections. So really making those intersections right. work appropriately. So that is included within this project list. Right. One more question. On the base estimated cost, you've got 2023 $20, dollars. What process do you use to update the 2018 base estimate to this modern one oh, now? Oh, and that's been part of the fun. I'm sorry um, I asked that question. No, that's quite all right. Um, we took each of these projects, we talked with our, um, our, in, uh, our uh, capital um, project staff who does cost estimates for us. We had them review what the 2018, the 2018 estimate, we updated that estimate, and then we needed to project to year of expenditure. So then there is a factor that um, projects the cost. And so the, the costs in the near term are, um, are escalated by a certain amount, and the costs in the far term mm -hmm. are escalated by another amount. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you see, those projects out in the farther years, which are with a much higher cost because it's um, taking into account, they'll be built when the costs are higher. Okay, thank you. Uh, this morning at the C4 Metro meeting, uh, many of the cities talked about this very same thing. And I, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, eight city, I think it was eight cities and NCPRD all doing this process to update the numbers. Uh, I was just curious as to uh, who puts that all together to make sure that they're all on the same sheet of music? I don't need an answer on that now, but I know it must be a very complicated thing. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Schrader, you're up. Uh, so I am not the transportation expert on this committee. I defer to uh, colleagues who have uh, taken that on. But my sense after hearing this, are we moving, since we are a transit desert, uh, colleagues and staff, are we moving more to... Um, fund things like SMART and those smaller interconnectivity kinds of uh, opportunities that we have with our communities that are actually seem to be more nimble in filling the transit gap that we have because we're not getting fully served by TriMet. Um, you, uh, it could be either. Yeah, we had that discussion, whatever. and yeah. Commissioner Savas is ready to talk about yeah. it. Okay. Uh, yeah, really quickly, and Karen, you can help back me up on this, but uh, at C4, um, we have, we formed a transit subcommittee group, and, you know, really they're on their own, but they've done a lot of great work. They are coordinating, they're connecting, they're making those connections, and because of HB 2017, we've gotten STIF dollars, okay. which... Um, helps enhance those connections. So they're doing a great job trying to do the interconnectivity. SMART is one of those, obviously all the others, but uh, more resources would do more for us. Karen, anything you want to add? No, I think that's accurate. Yeah. And I just wanted to, to, to mention that uh, uh, TriMet fought that bill way back mm -hmm. in the day when I was at the legislature, and that was uh, thanks to uh, 
uh, Representative Kurt Schrader and uh, Darling and Congresswoman Darling Hooley that they changed the law so the smaller communities or there was a larger opportunities for them to start filling the gap because of what they perceived to be the lack of service. So I, I'm seeing that then you're saying at the local level uh, continuing to be a trend and continuing to be a part of this conversation as we go through this. Transportation plan. Okay. Try and just wait for money to fall out of the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Yep. Commissioner West, you're up. Um, I, mean, I, I, I like to see so much emphasis on safety. You guys brought forward the 65th and Ellingson Stafford intersection roundabout, which um, I've spoke to um, quite a bit um, as you know a high crash area. Um, in Clackamas County. I guess my question is understanding how the process works with these funds a little bit better and I know that we're looking for federal help with federal funding, right? I know that the Congress is moving at, you know, pretty fast right now um, when we have some new freshman um, representatives and Lori Dreamer Chavez and Salinas. This project right here literally I don't know quite who's um, district it in. It might be slightly in CD5 and not CD6, but the border is like right there on 65th, right? Um, so I was just kind of curious with, you know, uh, Lori, uh, Congre Congressman uh, Chavez Dreamer being on the Transportation Committee, um, is how, what is, like, I just want to, like, are we, does that mean anything? Are we, are they motivated? Are we likely to get a little bit more for Clackamas County um, in funding? Or do we, am I asking something that's too soon? Or how does it weave into this process? Because, you know, I, I think it's good information for me to know and the public know. But um, I guess that's my question. Um, so I can't speak directly to that. That's probably a question maybe more public and government affairs staff could answer with regards to the likelihood of us being able to get projects because of different uh, Congress people, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about that, but I do know that there is, a, you know, various buckets of federal funds available, um, and each of them might have different focuses. And what's important for us to do is make sure that we have these projects on this RTP list, so that if any of them are the right fit, we, just, we can move. We got it. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we're in ready mode and yes. just ready to pounce, mm -hmm. kind of in the bushes, exactly. to go get that money. Okay. Um, we have two more commissioners for a second time. I want to speak for a first time on this. Um, the amount of these projects are horrendously expensive. Oh my gosh. And when you look at the 2018 fiscally constrained list, there's a couple of projects on there. The Beaver Creek Road expansion of four lanes past Oregon City High School to Myers Road. Well, recently, there's been a three to 400 unit apartment complex built on that. So does the developers have any responsibility when they add stressors to our transportation systems to help pay for road expansions? Secondly, who collected the transportation SDCs on that? Oregon City or Clackamas County? And what are they used for? Are they upgraded the traffic light? They built sidewalks, but you know, we can't drive cars on sidewalks. People out there will not be riding their bicycles, I can guarantee it. And the intersection, they did the um, ADA intersections at corner of Myers and Beaver Creek Road. I drive it twice a day, so I know what I'm talking about, okay? As people are moving out into our rural areas, Malala being the, one of the third fastest growing cities in the entire state of Oregon, because people seek to move out. What's happening with that? What is, again, the responsibility of the developer and what about transportation SDCs on this? Correct. So um, Beaver Creek Road is wonderfully complex. It's a county um, road, but a lot of it is within the city of Oregon City, right? Like the apartment complex, that's in the city of Oregon City, but it's directly adjacent to a county road, which is Beaver Creek Road. So when the um, SDCs, which are the system development charges um, related to transportation that are there, that are collected because of the new growth, right? I'm going to, like the apartment complex, hey, we're going to have new people, we're going to de increase demand on the system. The city of Oregon City collects those. 
system. And what do they do with them then? So they have a, a list of projects that they can expend the money on. So and does Oregon, I'm not interested in their list. I'm interested in Oregon City spend money from the expansion of Beaver Creek Road when it was their approval that allowed for a horrid amount of density, which used to be farmland, and it's three and four story apartments that are so close to Beaver Creek Road. I am really, and I talked to the mayor about this. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this project, Paul. Those apartments literally are this close to Beaver Creek Road. Yep. Oh my gosh. And is Oregon City paying for their part in the expansion of Beaver Creek Road? So I don't want to get too deep and far away from the RTP list. But I do. Okay. So I'm the chair, yeah. and you get to answer the question. So I'll let him answer. <laughs> you asked three questions. <clears throat> the first question, I mean, I can't, I don't know what the land use approval on that particular project look like, but developers are, are required to pay a proportionate share of their impact. So if you look at those roads, there were improvements that were should be done to those roads that were predicated off their use, okay? Second, you talk about SDCs. SDCs, <clears throat> are limited by statute on what they can be used for, and it's unfortunate um, in some cases. But essentially, um, jurisdictions develop SDC lists, <clears throat> and this is for anything, like water, sewer, whatever it might be, but they develop SD SDC lists because they have to be capacity improving projects. And you can only use those dollars on capacity improving projects. And, and with that, those monies normally, because of the methodology we're required to use, Normally, those methodologies don't cover 100% of that cost. So you'll see, um, you'll see projects that are like, hey, you know what, we want to widen this road, or we want to improve this road, but, and include another lane. That SDC methodology would only cover that widening that additional lane. It's additional capacity you build in the system. So it could be turn lanes, things like that. Um, and the question you ask is where they're using those dollars, and we'd have to research that for you and kind of see where their capital improvement plan is, and then also inform you about where they're directing specifically those SDC revenues that are coming in. So could they be collecting those SDCs on Beaver Creek Road and putting them into another area entirely? Um, there's no geographic boundary that I'm aware of that, that limits. That is very sad. Okay, so you say SDCs are collected for a fiscally or capacity expansion, but yet this is on our list for capacity expansion of a cost of $40 million. And my point is this, and I think you heard me the first time, but for the public out there, Clackamas County is trying to fix these roads. The local jurisdictions also have a share of the responsibility in adding to this list, as well as the new developments coming in and severely overbuilding. Now I'm going to go on to my next one right here, and that's Redland Road and Abernathy. Mm -hmm. That cost is $30 million. And we all know recently, with the addition of the courthouse, Oregon City says, oh, that intersection at Redland Road is failing by 0.04%, and it's a $14 million fix. So that's on our list also at $30 million, which on the 2018 fiscally constrained list, how do we get these projects off of the fiscally constrained list? So if you do the math, if the a project is $14 million and it's 0.01%. That's $140,000, which we all assumed that with the addition of the courthouse, we would have some transportation upgrades. That goes without saying. But for Clackamas County to take responsibility of that entire area where Abernathy Green Project is adding 500 housing units plus a whole bunch of commercial where on Washington Street a new Hamptons Hotel is being built and the Abernathy area transportation project that's being taken over by the private developer. By the way, that private developer did do a transportation study and yes, he is paying his fair share. But like he explained to me, he took a lot of time and said, these improvements are proportional based on use. And I'm just saying, here Clackamas County is doing in all these areas, we're busting our buns. You guys are busting your buns to identify programs that are into the 
billions of billions of dollars that we probably will not get funded. And I'm trying to say we need help from the other jurisdictions on this when they identify a problem and try to have us pay for it and the increased growth that's coming to Clackamas County, Oregon City, and South County. That felt like a statement more, or less, more than a question. Um, do you, do you I make agree. any efforts in that area? Do we make any efforts in that area? That particular intersection that you're referring to is specifically under the jurisdiction of, the, of ODOT, uh, Oregon Department of Transportation. There has been a regional discussion around that, which Karen may have more information. But um, it's on our list at. Mm -hmm. So, Dan, so that's ODOT's intersection. And I would agree, by and, the way. And I want to make sure you understand that you're clear that we are arguing the same statement that you just said, mm -hmm. which is the fact that there has been a. Per, there studies suggest that the courthouse project has tripped the capacity for that particular intersection. And our discussions that we are having with Nancy Bush is having with the city of Oregon City is that exact point. What is our proportionate share of that project improvement? It is not the project. Oh, I know. And you know that, we know that. Oh, I, I mean, know that. But, I'm just making a stink because yep. I can. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, give me a hallelujah. I'm good. Because um, <laughs> I totally agree with you. I, don't, I think the exaction is above and beyond. Um, personally, um, but you know, it's, it's working through their land use process to try to get that uh, mitigated, so. Okay. I just wanna make sure staff understands uh, how we can do with some outreach. Mark, you had your light on, do you still wanna speak? Well, all I wanted to say was, uh, Commissioner Schrader had a question about Clackens County uh, transit needs, and it's my understanding that when the RTP is done, Metro will conduct a suburban transit study to look at areas outside the high capacity transit map that Metro has to look at our areas of unserviced uh, roads areas and inadequately serviced. Isn't that true? It, it is my understanding that Metro will be um, conducting a, it, it's almost like a suburban transit study um, to be able to understand what kind of um, investments need to be made to really support uh, transit usage in the suburban areas. Okay. So not focused on high capacity transit, but really transit service. I look forward to that because that's going to be very important for us. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, this is a, a great opportunity to to actually address a couple concerns that Chair Smith is talking about and Commissioner West is talking about. Um, and that is, as these cities grow, um, whether it's Wilsonville and they expand with their uh, frog pond, which is estimated about 1,900 households, I believe. Right there by that intersection. Right. right. Yeah. Um, as Lake Oswego is expanding and growing, right? The biggest city in Clackamas County, mm -hmm. near 40,000, I believe. And they're growing and growing and growing, and the burden on Stafford Road is huge. Insane. So when the yeah. city, when the mayor of Wilsonville, the former mayor, came before us for uh, our blessing, urban renewal blessing for that, I raised the issue about the 65th Stafford danger issue. Yep. And, um, you know, I won't go into the politics that came out of that, but I was trying to make the point then, as I am now, that while they collect the SDCs for all those homes, transportation SDCs, and Lake Oswego is collecting their SDCs, there's no, they're, they're not contributing. And they, they legitimately can say, well, we can't spend cities or dollars outside our city. That's, that's your problem, Clackamas County, even though it's a county road that serves those cities, right, on each side of the freeway. Um, well, let me interject really quick on that one project. Wilsonville has committed $500,000 yeah. to help to that within their city budget. I don't know if it's enough or not, but there, there's something. Right, and I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss, dismiss the value of $500,000 when you look at the price tag for these projects. Project, but, but, correct. So the, the challenge really is, is this, is that when we did the VRF, for example, my problem was the formula. Why would the cities get more than their share? Why would they get more than 40%? when we have this big vacuum of funding, mm. right? Yeah. Where the rural areas or the county gets the short end of the stick. And this is, this is problematic at all costs. The other challenge with 65th in Stafford is we need the help from Washington County because a good chunk of that project is not in Clackamas County. It touches Clackamas County. Yep. So there is a shared cost. And I know our staff, transportation staff had worked with them, but this traffic circle up on, on the north part of Stafford Road, for example, 
Who's flipping that bill? It's not the city of Lake Oswego, as I understand, right? It's us. Not the totality, but we look to partner with all those entities. And so the discussion, when you look at those large capital projects that are on the periphery of a city, it's who's going to bring money to the pot to get the project done. Right. And, but, and, and we bring up, we have discussions around the, we leverage funds across every project that we do. Yeah. That's right, and, the, we do. and the circumstances around how you leverage those funds are, are predicated on the type of project it is, where it is. It's like if, you know, do we look to a city adjoining property? Do we look to the strategic investment fund that is directed towards, um, for partnering? That was the intent of that 10%. It's like, hey, do we, those county, city, ben mutually beneficial projects, do we look, put money from that fund into that? And that's, that's kind of our work. Mm -hmm. um, when, and through uh, Mike's great group and the work they're doing on the funding packages for all these projects, it's like, what's the project cost? What's a reasonable ask? Who's going to pay? Some, I mean, we have to, some discussions are harder than others. I mean, like drawing Washington County's attention to kind of 65th has kind of been a little bit difficult at times because they've got a lot of big needs out there. But it's like, hey, the time is right. You know, we've got money. We're looking to partner. And I want to make sure we're clear. 65th has been on our list for a while. Um, it's just been one of those things we've been talking about and balancing where funding goes. I just want to yeah. make sure the record is clear on that. Um, um, but it depends on a case by case on where it can be used um, and what and what sources they have at their disposal to use as well. Yeah. But, but the, po the point I'm really trying to make here is that the way the transportation funding system has worked, it, it, does, it disadvantages the county, I think, unfortunately. Uh, the, the, the small roads, um, whether they're county roads or they're state roads, um, in, the, in the growing areas, like, like 213 to Malala, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at where the investments are being, are being made, I mean, look at, look at Stafford Road. We put those two bridges in way back, what, 15 years ago? The, the, the two bridges, that's yeah. a lot, that was a lot of money, right? right? Um, that's a lot of burden to the county, right? And now with the traffic circle, right? Just think about the millions of dollars invested on Stafford Road and all the needs around the county and how much is the city who's enjoying the growth and the assessed value that we are too, but we can't use that for transportation, you know, AV. Um, it's, does, it's just 1400 linear miles of road. I know. You got to, you got to choose where you're going to spend it. I want to flip the script a little bit. I'm going to talk about 172nd. <laughs> that wasn't a big priority of ours, but you know what? <laughs> Funding came from this coming from the city to do that project. And we're leveraging some of our dollars because it is an important project that's 172nd North, but they're flipping the bill for a large majority of that. And so again, it goes back to kind of like project by project, who and where and what is available um, to fund it, so. And you guys have done a really good job of leveraging projects for small percentages of our money coming in. And almost every week there's something that comes up on the consent agenda and your match is about 10% of the overall cost and you should be commended for that. What you're hearing from the board I think today is our overall frustration at the overall cost and is everybody paying their fair share and why is Clackamas County the ones who are bound with picking up the bills? That's what you're hearing from us. Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, I have a question about the Oregon City development. Correct, but that does not mean that the land has been annexed, but that doesn't mean that the city actually still has auspice over the roads. No, we provide, condi we provide recommended conditions for those development if the road is still right. in our jurisdiction. So, we also don't go, I'm sorry, no, go, no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Um, we also don't have any, any statute doesn't dictate our ability to mandate transfer as well. So basically, um, where we get, where we gain, and that, that um, we've been trying to facilitate that because right. county roads that are within cities, more, the more we transfer, and we have some cities that are very good in that discussion, mm -hmm. it reduces our long-term liability for improvement of those projects. So we do that through like a financial adjustment that equates to a certain amount of improvement to that road, whatever it may be to facilitate that transfer. But we don't have the ability to say, hey, you know what, you annexed, you've got to take that road no matter what and we walk away from it. That was my question. Yep. So that's the crux of the matter. They can annex land in for development, but we will. We still have the bill for maintaining the road unless they are willing to take it under their own. Correct. Even um, more frustrating, they can use our, they can use right of way to cherry stem down to pick up properties that are way down here. I mean, 
Annexation, we've talked about this a lot. We, the state statute allows a variety of ways to annex into properties that we don't have a lot of control of, nor can we limit and or, and or reject it. So. so it probably sounds as if it needs to be a legislative fix where if you annex and develop. Congratulations, the road's yours. That'd be great. The road is yours, so I would suggest we look at it yeah, from that it. angle as well. That would make more sense to me. Um, and I'm glad you clarified that because I wondered about that. That if we're, and that's the whole crux of the Abernathy situation. In other words, if it's annexed into the city, there's no requirement for the, jur the municipal jurisdiction to actually pay for all those road improvements because they don't actually own those roads. Am I understanding this correctly, yeah. folks? Okay. They, yeah. they, yeah, they're, you're, you're right. But they're required to dict, they, they're required to dictate some developer con, not contribution, but payment for improvements. Okay. But, it is, but they're not mandated to take jurisdiction and long-term maintenance responsibility for the road. You're right. Yep. Mm, okay. Thank you. I just I thought that was the case, but I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. This has been a very good discussion today. We asked, the board asked that you come back and review this plan again. Um, final vote on this, Gary, is April. Remind us, uh, say what the timeline is, please. Um, we need to submit a letter to Metro on by May 24th. Oh, May 24th. So, um, so we would anticipate coming back to you um, okay. at the end of April, early May. Okay. So, commissioners, we do not have to take any action on either accepting or modifying this plan. I think it's probably still a work in progress. Any commissioner wants to opine on this moving forward? Gary, what's your suggestion? What, what direction do you need from the board today? So, um, I guess what I would say is that we have the head nod to submit these projects into the analysis um, that's going to be done over the next few months, and that we come back to you in May, or late April, May, um, before they are officially submitted into the RTP. I'm okay with that. Commissioners, what do you think? So just, just one clarification. Yes. Going back to the 205 discussion we had about that and removing that, is that still an advised or what? So um, the, the pathway that, uh, with regards to what we would submit um, on Friday, we were, we would submit what was set um, on that list that was within your packet today. And so that, pa that list does not include additional specific transit service on I-205 because that's included within TriMet's list. Okay. If you think that's adequate, I'm just wondering if, if us including it with a proviso that we discussed, you know, with emphasis on access, um, um, would it benefit? If not, then leave it as it is. Right. But something to tool over. I'm not saying make the call, but okay. if there's, if you guys want to think of th think through that, let me know. We've got some time. Yes, we'll, we'll exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. right. yeah, commissioners, all you know, we have time on this. If you want to offer input, have questions, go ahead and get those answered on your own. If you hear of anything in the community, bring them forth. Great. All right. Um, Gary, is that it? That's good, yes. Thank you. Hearing no business, further business before this commission, we are adjourned.